silver lining Keep your gaze on the sky Reach out a hand to the silver lining And remember the reason we fly Fly until you reach the silver lining Keep your Eleven Wings, Book 5, Farage Written by Brittany Chanel and performed by Kevin Montoya and Brittany Goodwin. Chapter 1. Farage My footsteps echoed off the walls of the empty palace as I carried Arena toward the front door. She was trembling, her arms and legs slack, her head rested against my chest, and her breathing faint. I needed to get her out of there, away from the palace, Hakari, and away from her usual routine so that she wouldn't feel the absence of her abilities. She was stronger than she knew, but everyone needs a hand every now and then. I was sure I wasn't the only Valkyrie who cared about her, but the others were drawn to the commotion of Argus's attempts to save Ajax, and I understood their fascination. The entire ordeal. From Valerie opening the portal, to Ajax running for his life to Lux of all places, was indicative of how quickly things were changing. We had a new Valkyrie for the first time in the hundreds of years, a traitor fighting for his life and a chance to save Thorn, all wrapped into one string of incidents. It was no wonder that Arena's quiet suffering had been overlooked by the others. I didn't know what she was thinking or feeling, but I knew she was at risk of moving on for good and I couldn't let her go on such a sorrowful note. We stepped into the light of the sun, just before it dipped below the walls of Akari City. The shadows were long, and I knew the streets would fill with dwellers once we cleared the palace walls. I shifted into hawk form, my bones cracking as they reformed. I took special care to support Arena's arms with my taloned claws as we rose into the sky. I felt a shift in weight just after we moved beyond the city and craned down, seeing Arena had her arms outstretched. How long had it been since her last flight? It had been at least a year since she'd lost her wing. She'd refused to let me fly her anywhere after the accident, confining herself to the palace. But I assumed it was because that was where she felt most comfortable. Arena closed her eyes, her face serene as the wind blew against us. I thanked the stars that taking her out of the city seemed to have been the right move. It was obvious that her spirit had improved. She looked almost jovial, free of the painful burden that she'd carried for so long. I headed straight for the Crimson Orchards, Hakari's sister island. The other Valkyries had access to it, but they rarely visited, mostly because they discovered their own havens around Lux, and the orchard happened to be mine. It was my place of peace and recovery. So naturally, when I saw how broken Arena seemed, my instinct had been to bring her there. I spotted the orchard floating above the clouds. The red hue of the foliage made it look like a rose suspended in the sky. I angled my wings for our descent, and the wind carried us down to the tropical terrain. The red plants were always jarring to see up close, but Arena seemed unshaken as she strolled along the forest floor, running her fingers along the tops of the fronds of the undergrowth. She wandered away from me, so I figured she needed a little space. I didn't bother shifting back to my human form as the squirrels and snakes were ripe for hunting. I'd eaten my fill of the orchard critters before I spotted Arena again. She was kneeling under an apple tree with her face turned towards the sun. I shifted back to my human form and was surprised when it made the orchard look so different. I almost always stayed in hawk form when I was here. I could see and hear the creatures skittering through the brush, but in human form? The orchard was patchy and red, the hues blending due to my limited eyesight, something like an impressionist oil painting. It seemed quiet. Still, speaking seemed almost sinful, but Arena looked so serene. I was afraid that at any moment she would move on, leaving the rest of us with nothing more than unexpressed gratitude. I took a seat beside her and closed my eyes, feeling the wind as it swept my hair off the nape of my neck. I'm sure your feelings are burdensome, but you can't leave. Not like this. 
Even without opening my eyes, I could tell she turned to me. It's better this way. I looked at her, searching for a bit of hope in her glassy eyes. I know the others would want a chance to say goodbye and to thank you for all the years you've served as our healer. You don't know that, she said, her voice sharp. You saw what I did. Now Argus has to his position as a Valkyrie was due to his qualities. Perhaps he came along just in time so that you could be relieved of your duties. She sighed and turned her face back to the sun. We have been your family for the last 600 years. You can't let one chaotic moment determine your view of everyone. But I must have a real family. It's time I move on so I can remember. It's time I reunite with them. I just think, why are you fighting this? She snapped, her voice like a weapon. Isn't your job as a Valkyrie to guard the people of this realm until they're ready to move on? Well, I'm telling you, I'm ready. Tears slipped from her eyes. Why are you talking me out of it? Because this is the wrong way. My reply came out harsher than I intended. So I took a deep breath to settle myself, waiting until I was calm. We'll throw you a party. Tonight. Tonight? Do you realize how close the eclipse is? We have Ajax to think about, Thorn is still down, and we don't know why. I shrugged. There will never be a perfect time, but a life like yours should be celebrated. Arena was silent for a long time. Then she stood. All right, then. If everyone agrees, let's have the party. Warmth filled me. Excellent. Let's go tell the others. I'm not quite ready to go back. I'd prefer to rest here a while. How about you get everything settled for tonight and then you come and get me before the party? I looked around. The Crimson Orchard was one of the nicest places to camp, with lush fruits and fresh water aplenty. I could see the appeal. It might give Arena some time to reflect before we sent her off, and who knew? Maybe she'd change her mind about leaving so soon. Are you sure? She yielded a smile, and it was the first genuine one I'd seen since she'd lost her wings. Yeah, I forgot how beautiful it was here. Our secret, I said now smiling too as I slowly got to my feet. She walked over and wrapped her arms around me, and I squeezed her tightly. I could see the relief in her face when we pulled away. Thank you, Farage. No, thank you, I said, rubbing her back. I hoped the others would be amenable to my party idea, but if they weren't, I'd have to find a way to convince them. Arena needed this, and even if the others didn't know it, they needed this too. Chapter 2 Valerie Time stood still as we watched Argus labor over Ajax's wound. Ajax had gone still, his body slumped against the hospital bed, but it was hard to tell if it was from a loss of consciousness or relief from the pain. I couldn't tear my attention away from Argus. His intense gaze, his steady hands. I can't believe he's a Valkyrie, CL whispered. He's so young. Jamin nodded. But don't you see why? How can he endure that much pain? I chuckled. He looks like a little angel. I was struck suddenly with concern. CL and Jamin continued to chat, but I didn't hear a word of it. The word angel rang through my vacant memories, filling me with a deep, unsettling dread, and I couldn't place the source. I turned away and headed back to the balcony. Angel. Every time I even thought of the word, anxiety accompanied it. I ran my hand through my hair as I stepped onto the balcony. The wind gusted against the side of my face, so I walked to the edge and looked out at the fluffy white clouds below. Angel. The word conjured images of peaceful winged people peeking over clouds and dancing in the sunshine. Angels were supposed to be like Valkyries, only not meant for battle and sent to do God's will. Wow. God. For the afterlife, religion seems suspiciously absent. Or at least I haven't heard anyone mention it. God, was that something I believed in? 
Did it matter? What rabbit hole did I just stumble down? I didn't notice Jamin approaching amidst my reeling until he spoke. You're not going to jump, are you? I turned, but I wasn't able to match his playful energy. I've barely even seen you with your wings out, let alone attempt to fly. I forced a smile. What's wrong? Jay, do you believe in God? Wow, Valerie, way to put him on the spot. He let out a slow breath. God? Oh, boy. He walked over and leaned against the banister. We don't know what exactly happens when we move on. But the way I see it, it couldn't hurt to believe in God. Just in case. Do I believe? I wasn't sure why, but asking about myself seemed even more intrusive than asking about him. He smirked and tilted his head. In a way, you were always more spiritual than religious. You believed more in interconnectedness, energy, kindness. He shrugged. I don't know, Valerie. He said with a smile. You were complicated. Okay, well, if you need to believe to get in or whatever. I'll save you a seat. Jamin took my hand, his gaze sweeping over my face and making me feel exposed. Is there something else? Angels. The word escaped my mouth before I had time to think about what I had said. He shook his head. What about angels? I don't know. Are they real? Are they... bad? He shrugged. I'm sorry, I can't really help with this stuff. Why the sudden interest? I tucked my hair behind my ear. I don't know. I took a deep breath. Jamin scratched the back of his head, then crossed his arms. Look, I... He sighed. I obviously won't hold you to this, but a while back, we discussed moving on and decided that when we were ready, we'd go together. His face turned bright red, his gaze firmly locked on the ground. His awkwardness alone was enough to cheer me up. Is that so? He shook his head, a smile playing at his lips, and without looking up, he said, Don't do this. He was so cute this way, all awkward and shy. It was a far cry from the moody guy who had rescued me from the rupture. Do what? You know, make it more uncomfortable than it already is. Why would I do that? You love to make me sweat? I closed the gap between us, forcing him to look at me. Well, you're not wrong about that. He smiled down at me. Okay, you have a deal. When the time comes, we'll go together. His eyes narrowed. You love me. I felt the heat rush to my face, but turned away quickly in an attempt to play it off. Whatever. Jamin grabbed me from behind and spun me before setting me down. My face hurt from smiling, and I was just about to hit him with some attitude when a voice echoed out from the palace. Guys, CL called as she rushed onto the balcony. Ajax is up. We followed her inside, and my mind ran through all the terrible things that Ajax could say. What if he exposed me as a traitor? Would everyone just take his word for it? The tension in the infirmary when we arrived was so strong. I felt nauseous. Argus sat on the floor, panting, and Ajax sat upright on the table, his wicked-looking wings on full display. CL stormed over to him. Why are you here? You saw? Valerie's portal. Amidst the commotion, I moved across the room to check on Argus. I knelt beside him. Are you okay? That was a very brave thing that you did. His face brightened, but it didn't quite reach his eyes, as if his exhaustion was overpowering his will. Valerie, did you see my wings? He asked, pulling at their fluffy ends. I sure did. You got them a lot faster than I did. He flashed me a smile, his missing front tooth center stage. It was hard to believe someone so young was now a Valkyrie. If he could be brave and take on this job, I was sure I could too. My thoughts moved to Arena, 
and I looked around the room, noticing for the first time that not only was she absent, but so was Farage. I was sure it must have been difficult to lose her abilities that way. It felt like everything was happening at once. Silence settled in around me, drawing my attention back to Ajax, who was leaned over his bedside, staring at me. Taking a deep breath, I finally spoke. What did I miss exactly? CL answered quickly. Idiot over here wants to talk to you. Why? CL eyed me, and Jamin moved closer in my defense, but looked away as if he was uninterested in the entire situation. CL kicked a trash can, and I nearly jumped out of my skin when it crashed against the wall near the window. This is ridiculous, she seethed. Jamin approached her. Take it easy. We're going to sort this all out. She rolled her eyes, gesturing to Ajax as if to say, get on with it. What are you running from? He smiled, enjoying our collective attention. You didn't seem as interested last night. I knew it was a stab at Jamin, but I'd told him about Ajax's visit, so I wasn't expecting any fireworks with that little reveal. If he wanted to shake me, he would have to do better than that. You didn't seem as scared. What's going on? What does this have to do with Thorn? His smile faded. It's dusk. He's... Ajax's eyes moved around the room like he was expecting dusk to pop in and scold him. After you escaped, he saw Thorn combat all those Riven and started to think that none of you would be willing to see beyond the veil. Now he's looking for a way to... What is it? Jamin blurted. Screw you, Jay. Just tell us, I said, thoughtlessly touching Ajax's arm. He's trying to consume the Valkram. Jamin started a slow clap. Congratulations. You chose the dark side, and now you're in danger. Firstly, we're all in danger. Look at Thorn. We all turned, and Thorn lay still on a bed by the window. And secondly, it's not the dark side. You'd know that if you were brave enough to look beyond the veil, like Valerie did. I swallowed a lump in my throat. Great, Jamin said. Why don't you let your little friend Dusk consume you then, for the cause? It's the way he's going about this. He no longer thinks we're capable of doing what's right. We need to all look beyond the veil and choose for ourselves. Valerie believed that. I stood. Then why did I leave? Why would I sacrifice my memories of all of you, leaving you at such a critical moment? Only you can answer that, Valerie. I felt a weight on my chest. The veil called to me. I could tell it did more than the others. Maybe that's what had drawn me to the nether realm to begin with. I failed to see what I could have possibly seen behind the veil that would possess me to give up so much. He either had to be lying or there was something big I didn't understand. I was fearful it was the latter. I glared at Ajax, but his olive green eyes teemed with sincerity. How can we save Thorn? He shook his head. We'd have to defeat Dusk and consume your Valkram. Jamin chuckled. You expect us to just waltz into Nether and attack Dusk? We wouldn't last a minute, especially without Thorn. No. I think Dusk will bring the fight to you. The Eclipse is only days away. If he consumes the rest of the Valkram, he'll have the power he needs to lead his charge on Lux. Which is what you want, right? CL asked. He sighed. This is pointless. I seemed to be the only potential mediator present. So say we wait for the Eclipse. Won't Dusk be too powerful for us to stop? Maybe. But I already absorbed my Valkram. Yours is missing, and I suspect that Jamin absorbed his as well. I doubt Dusk has a clue what just went down with Irina, or how to find Argus's Valkram, so that just leaves Ciel, Thorn, and Farage. I like those odds. Ciel scoffed. It seems like you've given this plenty of thought. She shrugged. I don't like this. This all feels like a setup. I don't trust this guy as far as... She looked around the room. Jay can throw him. My words toppled out against my will. I think he's telling the truth. My focus moved to Jamin, and after a moment of deliberation, 
He nodded. We should run all of this by Farage and Irina. Agreed, CL said quickly. What do we do with Ajax? We can't just have him wandering around Lux. It's too much of a risk. I say we lock him up. Jamin shook his head. Because that worked so well with Valerie. I say we try something new. My heartbeat thudded wildly against my chest. The others stared, waiting for the words I knew I might someday regret. I say we trust him. Chapter 3. Farage I flew to the palace with a renewed sense of hope. Things were changing, but that didn't have to be a bad thing. The sun had grown stale in the sky, the breeze pulling in a hint of cold from the impending night. I circled the palace and flew through the open window to the infirmary. Ajax sat upright on the bed, the understanding, in a half circle around him, like he was a meal they were about to devour. I shifted quickly, hoping to catch the end of their conversation, but all that I could hear was the blaring roar of awkward silence. What did I miss? Their faces brightened when they noticed me, and the tension in the room eased a little. I expected CL, spirited as she was, to be the first to give her take on the situation. But it was Ajax who answered first. I'm back on the team, he said. Jamin chimed in. He's not. I fought the urge to laugh. More than a year had passed, and these two had fallen right back into their old routine. I tried not to be nostalgic as Jamin filled me in on what I'd missed. My attention moved to Argus, who sat on the floor beside Valerie. Well done, Argus. Looks like Ajax is going to make it. He grinned, revealing his missing front tooth. But he didn't have his usual boundless energy. He was unusually quiet and still. Which made me wonder if Irina's reserved and timid presence was inherently part of what she was, or if it was a result of the pain she had regularly endured. The room fell into silence and I made sure not to disrupt it this time when I realized that no one had asked about Arena. Perhaps her fears about the others were a bit more grounded than I'd originally thought. I felt hurt on her behalf, but I was sure that after I explained everything, the others would come around. So, I started, rubbing my hands together, shall we talk about Arena? I surveyed their faces for concern, but didn't find any. I'd have to make do with their attention. She's doing all right. She wasn't expecting to have to pass her abilities on, but she seems a little relieved. CL scoffed. Relieved to pass them to a child? No offense, Argus. I know the situation is raw and that the timing isn't ideal, but Marina has spent centuries enduring all of our pain. We owe her a proper send-off. Send-off? Jamin asked. Is she planning to move on? I believe so. The mood shifted to where I thought it should have been all along. I didn't realize that things were so bad, Jamin said. Valor looked around the room, trying to measure everyone's reaction as just as I was, but it was obvious she didn't fully understand the permanence of Arena's decision. I was thinking of throwing her a party to celebrate her time as a Valkyrie and thank her for her service. A party? Everyone turned to the door where Lily stood. You're going to throw a party when Thorn is in this condition? Ajax hopped off the bed and headed for the door. Well, that's just about all the family drama I can take for the day. You coming, Valerie? Valerie shook her head, confusion overtaking her features. Me? He grinned. This has nothing to do with you or me. Let's have a look around while they get their crap together. No, I, I don't want to go with you, Valerie said as her gaze moved to Jamin. Ajax said, you don't need permission. I'm sure Jamin won't be jealous. He trusts you. Jamin clenched his jaw. But I'd like to take Argus to rest, said Valerie at last. Ajax clapped his hands together. It's settled then. Valerie lifted Argus, retracting her wings and carrying him toward the door. Ajax put his arm around her, and he flashed a smile at Jamin before they left. Lily joined us, her questions still hanging in the air, unanswered. That's rough, buddy, CL said, fanning the flames. My knee-jerk reaction was to put the fire out. Jay, I said, it'll be all right. He's all talk. You know that. I'm not jealous, Jamin shouted, walking toward the window. It just feels like history's repeating itself. Give Valerie more credit than that, I pushed. Lily glared at me. What happened to Arena? Why isn't she healing Thorn? Arena's no longer a Valkyrie. 
Argus has her power now, CL said. Lily stared. But, but he's a child. CL fiddled with the hilt in her sword. We know. What, what is wrong with everyone? Arena deserves a proper send-off. She's been saving you all for hundreds of years, including you, Lily. If this is her last night in Lux, we have to send her off right. She has to know how much you all appreciate the sacrifice she made. She's our friend, a family member, whether she has wings or not. She didn't choose to pass her abilities on. The choice was made for her, and she's devastated. Think about how you'd feel. My speech was met with silence. So I continued. Not to mention the fact that you all just abandoned her the second she lost her wings, as if all those years meant nothing to you. I know that Argus is young, but you saw what he can do already. He was made for this, and it's no fault of Arena's. Jamin sighed. He's right. Things have been intense lately, but she deserves something nice. Let's throw her a goodbye party. CL smiled. Lily, you have a problem with that? Lily crossed her arms over her chest. Of course not. Good, CL said. We only have a few hours to pull this off. Jay, you handle the food. Farage, the drink, and I'll get the musicians together. Lily, spread the word and see if you can get some people to help out with decorations. Party starts at sundown. Jamin said, maybe you should give the food to- No, you need to stay busy. I don't want any love triangle drama tonight. Got it? I smirked at them and shifted quickly. I was going to need to get our reserve of Branberry Ale to the ballroom. I barely had enough time to pull it off, but I felt hopeful that Arena would get the send-off she deserved. I knew that once the chaos died down, the Valkyries would be glad we had taken the time to say our goodbye properly. And who knew? Maybe the party would remind Arena of why it might be worth sticking around a little longer. Chapter 4 Valerie I cradled Argus in my arms, admiring the leafy crown that was woven into his curls. If I hadn't seen it myself, I wouldn't have believed that someone so small could be capable of something as big as saving someone from their final death. Beyond that, I was consumed with thoughts of Irina and her decision to move on. My initial instinct when I had arrived had been to do that as well. But after getting sucked into the lives of the other Valkyries, I'd understood why they hadn't let me. Still, it would be nice to see how the ceremony was performed and get some idea of what to expect if Jamin and I ever decided to leave this place behind for the unknown. Ajax hummed gleefully beside me as we walked Argus through the city. I recognized the melody instantly as one Jamin had hummed as well. I hated how Ajax pushed Jamin's buttons. I hated his smugness, his connection to the darkness, and his betrayal of the other Valkyries. But he knew things about me that the others didn't. He knew why the darkness called to me. You seem too chipper for someone who nearly died a few hours ago, I said, concentrating on the uneven cobblestone path. And you seem too beautiful to be committed to that killjoy. I glared at him. Relax, love. Didn't you hear? There's to be a party tonight. Argus's big brown eyes opened. Do I have to miss the party? I swear I'm not tired. I gave him a little squeeze. Of course you don't have to miss it. After all, you're a Valkyrie now. I'm just taking you home to get some rest before it starts. I felt his muscles relax and his blinks grow slower until he finally surrendered to sleep. I heard an odd creaking sound as we approached his apartment. Across the alley was a mint green shutter that seemed out of place as it hung on by one hinge, creaking when the wind blew it. Ugh, how can he stand that? Ajax asked. Sometimes imperfections make a place home. I carried Argus into his apartment and lay him on the couch, the uniform layout making it easy to get my bearings. I looked around the apartment, noticing Argus's clothes strewn around with some books and games. He didn't live alone, did he? I supposed his family must have moved on directly, but shouldn't someone else be looking after him? I wondered if he'd consider moving to the palace, just like Irina had. Then we could all keep a closer eye on him. Ajax stood at the door, grinning. Well, 
he said smugly. We're losing daylight. Let the little man rest. I felt the sudden rush of fear surge through me. I guess since we had Argus, I couldn't consider myself alone with Ajax. But that's exactly what I was. I was nervous that he'd bring something out in me. Something that I'd been trying to bury since I arrived in Lux. I think we should go back to the palace and find out what the others plan to do. Not a chance. Come on. You said you trust me. He held out his hand. I felt my heartbeat quicken before I took it, letting me know that I'd already made up my mind. We stepped outside and he walked behind me, sliding his arms around my waist. You know, darling, you really ought to learn to fly. He whispered into my ear. His grip tightened, his dark, bat-like wings spreading wide. Then we took off into the air. I recognized the area before we arrived. I'd walked it once with Farage. We landed at the edge of the salt flat just as the sun began to set. The mirror-like surface was thus transformed, bedecked with bands of red and orange, and it seemed like we were walking through fire. Ajax watched me, but my attention was glued to the salt flat and the way the sky and the horizon were indistinguishable as the colors blended together. Have you been here? As a matter of fact, yes. I bet you a kiss it wasn't Jay who took you here. Farage, I said, watching him in the water's reflection. That makes more sense. He's always been a little more open-minded than the others. What did he say about it? I walked further out as my steps caused the glassy water to ripple. That it was my favorite place. Would you like to know why? When I looked up, Ajax's green eyes were more intense, juxtaposed with the vivid reds of the sunset's cosmic palette. He pushed his hair out of his face as he approached, and my pulse rose with each step he took. I wasn't sure what he was going to do, but even scarier... I wasn't sure what I was going to do, either. He reached out, and I put my fists up, ready to defend myself if this was some kind of advance. Instead, he reached out and lowered my chin, pulling my gaze down to my reflection. He put his hands up in surrender and then backed away. I stared into the rippled water, waiting for the image to clear, waiting to understand. Ajax spoke softly, but the wind carried his voice to me as if it was delivering a secret. This is where you discovered the truth. I stood perfectly still and stared at my own reflection. I took a deep breath and felt the rush of my discovery toss around the fragments of my lost memory. It would have been easy to dismiss everything Ajax said as a lie. A con to get me alone and to make Jamin jealous but I could feel the truth hovering just on the other side of my reflection. This path had seduced me before. It had caused me to do the unthinkable, and it had cost me my memories. Yet, the urge to know ate away at me, still like insatiable hunger. Ajax watched from afar in silence, as the sky's reds cooled to purple and then faded to dark blue, Finally, when the air chilled my bare shoulders, he returned to my side, obscuring my reflection with his steps. Let's go, darling. We have a party to crush. Chapter 5. Farage There was a genuine air of excitement as the party started to take form. Jamin had enlisted the help of Hakari's finest chefs to prepare the food, and the palace was full of the sweet, buttery scent of pastries. Dwellers had started to arrive just as the sun was setting, dressed in their finest garments, and when the musicians began to play, one couldn't help but pause to admire the general splendor. I wasn't certain such an effort was only for Arena, but it was nice to see the Valkyries coming together. All we needed was the guest of honor. I shifted into hawk form and headed straight for the orchard. The air was a bit brisker than I was expecting, but that always seemed to enhance the coziness of an event. I did a quick sweep of the orchard in hopes of spotting Arena quickly, but with all the lush, red plants obscuring my view, I knew it was a long shot. I dove below the first line of trees and perched on a branch with a decent view to scan the area. My vision as a hawk form was much sharper, as if I needed any more reason to remain in this form. I could see the ultraviolet trails of all manner of creatures, the Riven included, and track them easily. 
It should have been an easy task finding Arena, but as I flew from branch to branch searching my island for her, I began to grow increasingly nervous. After 40 minutes, I was sure I'd checked every inch. I shifted back to my human form, sweat beating on my forehead as I raced through the foliage. Arena! I called, my heart pounding against my chest. I replayed our last encounter again and again in my head, searching for a sign that might indicate she'd done the unthinkable. I burst through the tree line to the orchard grove and fell to my knees. My body shook as I reeled under the weight of what happened. I should have stayed with her. I thought I had convinced her to let us send her off right. I couldn't believe that she just let me go put together a party and then perform the ritual on her own. My shoulders shook as I let out a sob, hoping that somehow she knew how much we all appreciated her effort as a healer. I searched my memories, unsure if I'd ever expressed it, but my emotions washed away my focus. How could she leave with everything so unresolved? Had something changed while I was away? Or was this her plan all along? I couldn't help but feel responsible. If I hadn't left her alone in this orchard, we might still have had time with her. How was I supposed to show up to the send-off party without her? I'd been gone an hour. They'd come looking for me soon. What was I going to tell them? I sat with my legs crossed and turned my palms up, resting my hands on my knees and forced myself into meditation. But Arena's face kept slipping into my head, stirring my sense of calm like a gust of wind sweeping through a pile of leaves. I sat still, focused on my breathing. Slowly, my body calmed and the fog cleared from my mind. My last conversation with Arena played in my head. She'd wanted to move on. She believed it was against our nature to prolong that desire. I breathed in the truth and exhaled the pain. I'd been selfish. Selfish to try and send her off the way I wanted, blindly forcing it on her without regard for her feelings. She had wanted it this way. She had moved on and found the ultimate peace. Words were a hollow comfort. I miss my friend. Her actions felt so permanent and I stared ahead at an eternity without her with an aching heart. Was it so wrong to want to say goodbye? Was it so wrong to prolong it? I felt an ache inside, knowing that the pain I'd felt would be my duty to deliver to the others. What should have been a celebration of gratitude would now become a funeral. I stood and wiped my face. I took a deep breath, but it hitched when I exhaled. I had to get back to the party and let the rest of the Valkyries know. At least I'd have the short flight to pull my thoughts together. I shifted, spread my wings, took to the sky. My wings wavered, sending my body swaying unintentionally in the pull of the wind until I could recover. I soared above Hakari City and circled the brightly lit palace, where music poured from the windows and joy filled the air. I'd hoped to find Ciel, but Jamin stepped out onto the balcony. Instinctively, I dove toward it, shifting as I leveled out just above the landing. Jamin smiled when he saw me. What do you think? He said. Gesturing back toward the party. Not bad for last minute. His smile faded. Where's Arena? I knew if I spoke, my emotions would spill out, so I shook my head, hoping he'd catch my meaning. He stared at me. And a minute passed silently as he processed the news. He retracted his wings, walked back into the party. I followed him, just in case he was hurting more than he showed. He pushed through the crowd toward the front of the palace, and I realized he was searching for CL. I was glad that I didn't have to share the news again, but I couldn't tell by his speed that he was agitated. I reached out to pat his shoulder, hoping to grab a quick word before we brought anyone else in on the news. Then I looked up at the front door. Valerie stepped through, her arms hooked around Ajax's as they arrived. I could feel the sudden shift in heat as Jamin's gaze moved to them. 
In a panic, I searched the crowd for Argus, but I didn't see him. Whatever came next, I knew we'd need a healer. Chapter 6 Valerie Jamin's gaze moved between Ajax and me. His eyes were ablaze, fierce with intensity that I couldn't understand. Where were you? He asked coldly. The harshness in his voice pulled the attention of the partygoers, and a crowd started to form in seconds. Relax, man, Ajax said, stepping between us. Jamin slapped his hand away. Don't touch me. What's wrong with you? I asked, grabbing him by the wrist and pulling him outside the party. I knew if I didn't separate Jamin and Ajax, things were going to escalate, and quickly. The night air was brisk, and I hoped it would help calm Jamin down. I pulled him away from the palace door and into the garden so that we'd at least be out of the direct view of everyone at the party. He pulled his wrist free and turned on me. Why were you here with Ajax? He asked as he paced away. Why are you wearing that? We'd spoken about the dress not being my style, but it didn't take a genius to riddle out that something deeper was wrong. I thought Irina would like it. Jay, what's wrong? Irina's gone. She just performed the ritual and moved on without saying goodbye. Oh my god. I'm so sorry. Why the hell would she do that? His voice cracked, tears springing to his eyes. He closed the gap between us and his gaze bore down on me. Why would she just leave like I mean nothing? Like what we had meant nothing? My heartbeat stuttered when I realized he was no longer talking about Irina. He wiped his eyes and shook his head. It's selfish. I took a deep breath. I'm sorry about Irina. I know it must be hard to lose someone you care so much about. Do you? My face burned hot. His anger at me didn't feel justified. Not based on the story Ajax told me about the night I left. Jamin had only recently begun to open up, and certainly not about that night. I know you're in a lot of pain right now, I said, reaching out for him. But I promise it's going to be okay. He scoffed. Can't you see? It's all happening again. I can feel you getting pulled back to the dark side, and I can't do shit to stop it. Look, I don't think you're being fair. Seriously? You show up here with him, and you have the nerve to say that to me? You need to let the jealousy go. It's only getting in the way. Valerie, you left me for that guy. No, I didn't! I yelled, plunging us into silence. He stared, and I felt a lump rise in my throat. I spoke again, this time keeping my voice level. That's not what I was told. By him? I crossed my arms. You tell me then. Did I ask you to go with me that night? The night I left? His jaw bulged from how hard he was clenching it. I nodded. So, I asked you to come and you didn't, and yet you still blame me for leaving. You wanted to go to Nether. You wanted to be with those monsters. How could you ask that of me? Maybe I was asking you to trust me, and you didn't. Anger forced tears to my eyes. You want to talk about how Ajax is evil for going to that side? But from what I've been told, I asked him to come, and he just dove in. No questions asked. So you're with him now? I wasn't, but maybe I should be. I pushed past him. You don't mean that. I took a deep breath, but it shook when I exhaled. I've had enough of everyone questioning my loyalty. I want to know who among us has my back. Let me know when you've decided if that's going to be you or not. When I entered the palace, there was a crowd silently listening by the door. They stared at me, their piercing stares punctuating the pain in my chest. I wanted to curl up into a ball on the floor and cry, but I was tired of sadness. I eyed a waiter that held a silver tray full of Bramberry ale, walked up to him and took a goblet, raising it to the crowd. To Irina, I said cheerfully, before I tipped the goblet back and downed its contents. The crowd dispersed, resuming the party as the music started back up. 
Farage remained motionless, so I placed my empty goblet back on the tray and grabbed two more. I handed one to Farage. Are you all right? He asked. Are you? He bumped his goblet against mine in response, and we had a drink together, the fizzy liquid easing the tension in my body and numbing the ache in my chest. Farage smiled slightly. You seem... different, I offered. He shook his head. No, you seem like Valerie. Welcome back. I smiled and had another sip of ale when I noticed Ajax smirking at me from across the room. Even without moving, he beckoned me with his snake-like eyes. I walked over, swaying in tandem with both the music and the ale sloshing around my stomach. Ajax said, What on the street is you and Jay broke up? That doesn't concern you. Believe me, it does. I rolled my eyes, but the Bramberry Ale had taken much quicker than expected, and I stumbled back. Ajax caught me by my waist. How about a dance? It might have been a temporary fix, the ale, the dance, the party, but it gave me a little time to delay the hurt that was tearing me apart inside. I was in good company, as everyone at the party had lost someone— Farage joined in in the festivities, and shortly after my fight with Jamin, Ciel arrived to say he'd taken her post at the rupture. We all could pretend for a little while that purgatory was bearable. We all could forget that we were still losing people, just like we had in life. If we partied hard enough, we could forget that the pain of our existence was ever-present. Indelible. Chapter 7. Farage I returned to the orchard the next morning, partially to hunt and reset, and partially so I could have one last look for Arena. I knew she was gone, but somewhere deep inside lingered a bit of hope, however misguided it was. I returned to the palace, unsure about how we'd all find peace when things were unraveling so quickly. My feelings about Ajax were neutral, just because his beliefs differed from mine didn't mean I could condemn him. But having him around was a risk. What would stop him from helping Dusk from behind enemy lines? That was the least of my concern, though. I was more worried about Jamin and Valerie. Ever since the eclipse, they hadn't been able to work through what happened. They were much stronger together than they were apart, and the team benefited greatly from it. Love was a powerful weapon, regardless of what side it was on. Valerie was starting to come back into her own. She was decisive and unapologetic, but Jamin was drifting, and it didn't seem right to sit idly by while Ajax took advantage of it. Ajax was attractive, everyone's type, including mine, but what Jamin and Valerie had was real, and I doubted any amount of time apart was going to stop them from finding their way back to each other. It couldn't hurt to nudge it along a bit, though... I swooped into a skylight by the palace bells and shifted into my human form. I headed straight for the infirmary, where the Valkyries were already seen to be gathered. As I neared, a tearful lily rushed out of the room. He's up, she said, her face bright. Thorn. I rushed into the room and Thorn was seated on his bed, devouring a plate of leftover party food. His smile filled me with a deep sense of relief as I'd been swimming against the current since he'd been down, and seeing him reversed its direction. You look like you've seen a ghost, he said. I feel like I'm looking at one right now. How are you feeling, I asked, looking around the room. Where's Argus? He's resting, he said, nodding toward the corner. Tucked away in a shadowed corner, Argus was curled up on a small couch, his wings draped over him like a blanket. Thorn popped a cream puff in his mouth. He's strong. I nodded. But, Arena... Lily filled me in. He looked toward the window. I wish she had waited a day, you know? I nodded. Sensing the somber mood, Thorn said, And what's this I hear about you throwing a party? I'm gone a few days and this place descends into chaos? My chest warmed. I felt like the fate of the Valkyries was no longer in my hands. Thorn would watch over us. He always had. He sighed. And what's this mess about Valerie and Ajax? I shook my head. I don't know exactly. 
Does he have a chance with her? I slipped my hands into my pockets. I, I don't know. Part of me thinks he does. Jamin's been a little lost. He shook his head. Damn. Well, let's keep them apart for whenever possible, just in case. How about you teach Valerie how to fly? I'll send Ciel to the rupture and have Jamin give me his side of things. I walked over and threw my arms around Thorn, plate and all. He chuckled and patted my back. I'm so happy you're back. Glad to be back, buddy. It was a sound plan. There wasn't another Valkyrie who knew more about flying than I did. I felt a lot safer knowing Thorn was going to have a strategy session with Jamin. We'd been floundering and needed leadership to bring us all back to the same page. I had a theory that we'd failed to make it through the last eclipse because we got separated. And once again, we were drifting. Just in time for the next one. If we were going to come together, it had to be now. Of course, that was easier said than done. I shifted and flew out the infirmary window, heading straight for Valerie's apartment. I couldn't wait to share the news of Thorne's return with her as I knocked gleefully on the door. My stomach dropped when a shirtless Ajax opened the door. I stared, half stunned by his chiseled body and half horrified to find him there. I pushed him back into the apartment just in case Jamin happened to fly by. Where's Valerie? I asked, bursting into her apartment. Ajax sighed. She's not here. I began opening closets and peeking around drapes, half expected to find her half-dressed. Anger tore through me. Valerie! I said she's not here. I spun. Where is she then? She's at the salt flat. He stretched his arm over his head. Relax, Hawkey. Nothing happened. I crashed on the couch because I couldn't find the key to my apartment. Your apartment isn't locked. He scratched the back of his head grinning brightly. Must have slipped my mind. Look, Ajax, I know you think you're pretty cute, and you can come in here and turn Valerie's head because she's trying to figure everything out, but she's catching on fast. His demeanor turned cold, but I didn't stop there. When she does, she'll make the same choice. They love each other. Leave it alone. Sounds like you think I have a chance. I don't, I said but the words came out too quickly to be believable. You seem pretty certain for someone who never puts himself out there. This isn't about me. All the years I've known you, I haven't seen you date a single guy. I told you, I have someone waiting for me when I move on. You say so, but you don't know, do you? That's the point of purgatory, isn't it? You forget about the people you knew in life until you move on. Want to know what I think? I think you're too afraid to shoot your shot with anyone. At least I have the balls to love. My voice was steady and low. Your beliefs are no concern of mine. I know he's there waiting for me. And why don't you move on? I headed for the door. I will. When it's time. Before he could respond, I slipped out the door and shifted, heading straight for the salt flat. Chapter 8 Valerie I stared into my reflection and felt the truth staring back at me, but I couldn't see it. Ever since Ajax had brought me here, all I could think about was coming back. Partially because I knew if I'd discovered the truth here before, I could do it again. And partially because Ajax and Jamin were driving me crazy. I liked Ajax for a lot of reasons. I enjoyed his company, his energy, and the strength of his convictions. I could still feel our lost friendship brimming beneath all of our interactions, but this love triangle nonsense was a complete scam, and I wasn't sure he even knew it. It only took a few moments of spending time with him to realize his feelings were puddle deep. He cared more about winning me than having me. He was just competing with Jamin and trying to push his buttons. It seemed obvious to everyone except him and Jay. If Ajax could relax a little, I was sure he'd see it was his friendship that had compelled him to follow me into Nether, and nothing more. My feelings were excruciatingly clear. Ajax was undoubtedly beautiful, as all of the Valkyries were, but the disconnect between Jamin and me had nothing to do with Ajax. I might have been hard on him, getting angry when he was grieving over the loss of a friend, but I was tired of being accused and punished. 
Tired of being Jamin's punching bag whenever he got overwhelmed and implying that I had an interest in Ajax might have been too far. I might have heard him when I'd left, but that had been a lifetime ago, and he wasn't the only one walking around Lux with a broken heart. I swiped my hand across the water, groaned, and lay flat in the pristine shallows, staring up at the sky. I was positive that Jamin and I had finally been connecting during our date. And the second Ajax arrived, that bond had shattered as if it were made of glass. Why won't he just love me? The emotional exhaustion was the worst of it. I'd fallen in love with him a second time, only to end up lying out on the salt flat. A large bird flew overhead and began to circle me. Great, it thinks I'm a carcass. The buzzards have come to clean my bones. I watched it drawing closer, mesmerized by the motion. Then it dropped a little too close, and a wave of fear had me scrambling back to my feet. That's when I noticed the blue-green hue. Farage. He circled me a little more before he shifted and landed a few feet away, spraying me with the splash from his drop. Damn, girl, should I have brought ice cream? He asked with a grin. The answer to that question will always be yes. I've been looking for you. Yeah? I checked at your apartment. Ajax was there, shirtless. I sighed. He was digging for information. It was better to be vague. Yep, he shifted, his head tilting to one side. Valerie, what are you doing? You love Jamin. I know, I said, turning away. You do, but does he know that? I shrugged. Sometimes love isn't enough. My emotions swelled, and I needed a quick change of topic to keep from getting upset. It doesn't matter anyway. The eclipse is coming. The team is a mess. Thorn's awake. My mouth dropped open. Really? That's just what we need. When did he wake up? Earlier today. He sent me here to teach you to fly. He clapped his hands and rubbed them together. Come, let's see those wings. I didn't like to bring them out when I was in Lux. Their monstrous form was a reminder of my past choices. Choices that once again called to me. But I'd practice letting them out and putting them in at will when I was alone. I hated the hour-long walk to the salt flat, and the climb was a bitch on my glutes. If I was going to make the salt flat a regular place to visit, I needed to fly. I spread my wings, and to my surprise, Farage didn't so much as flinch when he saw them. He ran his hands along each one, inspecting them with the studious, detached eye of a medical professional. He felt the bat-like material between his palms and measured the length of them against my height. After several silent minutes, he stepped back and nodded. They're a little different than what I'm used to, but we should be able to get you off the ground. I was comforted by his confidence and happy to have a friend around. He walked me back toward Hakari City, explaining the wind currents and wing positions as he used his hand to demonstrate. I enjoyed his academic approach. It was so different from how I imagined the other Valkyries would have tried to teach me. It was obvious how passionate and knowledgeable he was about the topic. More so, I figured, because he could fully shift into bird form— he had me so calm and at ease as we reached the bridge to Hakari that I almost forgot how helpless Jamin made me feel. I was excited for a new chapter, thrilled to feel the wind on my face. I turned to hug Faraj and thank him for the flying lesson, but I stopped when I saw his abrupt, bright smile. Without warning or effort, he tossed me off the bridge, plunging me into freefall. Chapter 9. Farage Valerie dropped like a rock into the endless abyss. It wasn't really my place to intervene, but if her life happened to flash before her eyes and she'd realize how much Jamin meant to her, all the better. Still, I knew that was kind of a long shot. She was stubborn but also very thoughtful about her actions. I was sure there was more going on inside her than she let on. I just hoped that by the time Jamin got his act together, she wouldn't have done anything she couldn't take back. I shifted to hawk form and dove after Valerie, the cloud cover obscuring my view. 
I'd given her a bit of a head start to make the chase more interesting, so I wasn't alarmed when I didn't immediately see her. Then a few minutes passed, and I felt a sliver of panic work its way in. I'd go faster and faster, bursting through the layers of silvery cloud cover, only to find myself staring at the empty sky. Did I just kill Valerie? Where did she disappear to? My mind started conjuring worst-case scenarios. Had she hit the cliff's edge? Had she angled herself straight down? Had she mistakenly opened a portal and fallen through? I spread my wings, heading back up toward the bridge, already trying to find the words to explain to the others how I'd lost her. Then, I saw her up ahead, awkwardly gliding with her cute little bat wings. I exhaled my relief and let out a celebratory cry with my beak. As I neared her, I could see the bright, goofy smile on her face and I could have sworn that she was back to her old self. Her joy reminded me of how much I enjoyed flying as well. Something I tried not to take for granted, but often did. I positioned myself in front of her so she could copy the angle of my wings. I love the way my wings flex as they cut through the air. I love the total freedom, the wind in my face, the taste of the dewy clouds, and the rush as I whipped through Lux's endless sky. I'd forgotten that flying has always been its own form of meditation. I looked back occasionally, but there was no need. Valerie had no trouble drifting behind me, mimicking my patterns and learning once again how to trust her wings. It was still there inside her. Maybe she would never recover her memories, but her body still knew how to fly. It was nice to have someone to fly with, someone who remembered how much they loved it. So I guided Valerie on a little tour, bobbing and weaving through the air currents. After several hours, she began to slow, especially when we flapped our wings to elevate. She was getting tired. So I doubled back and grabbed onto her with my taloned legs. I dropped her back on the bridge and shifted, drinking in her smile. That was amazing, she said. You did very well. She flipped her hair and did a little dance that made me chuckle. I was pretty good, wasn't I? Tomorrow, I'll teach you how to properly take off and how to land without getting hurt. Not that I think you're a flying hazard. She laughed. You don't know my life? She spun with her hands stretched over her head and the ends of her pink hair cascading over her shoulders like a waterfall at sunset. You know... It's so nice to think out here. She leaned over the bridge's banister and held her hand out over the drop. She was surprisingly comfortable after I'd thrown her so suddenly over the edge. I thought she'd have to struggle a little more than she did, but she must have been ready to fly. There was plenty more to teach, more skill-intensive work, but I was pleased with her quick progress. It was as if her soul needed the nourishment, just as mine did. Definitely. It's one of the reasons I try to spend so much time as a hawk. I took my place beside her at the banister. I often tell myself that I'm never shifting back to my human form, but I always do. Why do you think your powers are that way? I wanted to be careful with my reply, in case she was trying to understand her own power, and why it seemed to connect her to the darkness. I think it's the ability I would have chosen for myself. She nodded and rested her chin on her arm, staring out at the blue sky below. I took her by the hand and walked her toward the gate to the city. My attention moved to Ajax, who stood under the arches, smirking as we neared. Should I meet you at your apartment tomorrow, or will you be at the salt flat? I asked. What are you doing tonight? Let's do something. It was encouraging to see her eager not to spend time with Ajax. I have guard duty tonight. I gotta make my way over there soon, but CL should be free. Right, she said. I'll try her. I need to get back to the orchard to meditate before my stint at the rupture, but I could stop by the palace and let Thor know that the flying lessons had gone better than expected. Before I shifted, I turned to Valerie and said, by the way, Ajax's apartment isn't locked. Chapter 10 Valerie I walked the streets of Hikari and began the long climb to my apartment. Ajax insisted on walking me, but I didn't mind the company. He was enough of a distraction to keep me from replaying my fight with Jamin in my head, along with the sadness that accompanied it. In fact, I had activities lined up for the rest of the day to keep myself busy. I was going to head home and shower, then visit Thorn at the palace and hopefully meet up with Ciel. Darkness drifted over Lux 
and I looked to the sky as storm clouds started to roll in and block out the sun. We only made it a few more steps before the pitter-patter of rain began to fall around us. Thunder echoed through the city, and dwellers who were out on the street scattered, rushing to find shelter in their homes. I pulled out my wings to cover myself, but the wind nearly knocked me off my feet. Ajax's hand pressed into my shoulder, and my wings retracted. I'd miscalculated. The narrow streets made using my wings for cover more cumbersome, so I put my head down and blocked as much of the rain as I could with my arm as I raced home. Valerie, Ajax called through thunder. I'm going to head to my apartment. Do you want to join me? No, I'm good. I'm just going to head home too. I called back over my shoulder. Ajax nodded and then ducked into an alleyway toward his place. No sooner did I lose sight of him than did the sky open up, lightning tearing through the clouds. The wind howled and the rain grew colder every second. I shivered, passing the last of the people still scrambling toward their homes. The rain slammed down in sheets, beating against my skin. My shoe slipped against the slippery stones, but I caught myself. I shivered violently, squinting through the downpour. I gauged that I had to survive at least 20 more minutes in these conditions before I'd make it to my apartment. Thunder rattled my bones as if the sound had come from just over my shoulder. Fear tore through me. I sprinted up the steps, but my shoe slipped again. This time, my momentum was a hindrance. I fell to my knees, scraping them against the stone. The next crack of thunder shook the entirety of Lux. Instinctively, I put my head down on the steps, letting the cold rain ease my scraped knees. The rain instantly halted. The sun was blacked out, and when I looked up, two familiar beady eyes stared down at me. It was a hawk. The bird nudged me with his beak. I got to my feet, turning off my path, the sound of grinding bone just behind me. Farage pushed me against the wall, blocking my body with his as he scanned the area around us. He took a moment to catch his breath. Then he said, This storm isn't natural. This is Dusk's work. Lightning struck so near to the houses that I could taste the energy as it rushed through the air. I wasn't sure how he'd found me, but I was more than glad to see him. It had rained a handful of times since I'd been in Lux, but never like this. My first thought was to blame it on this entire city being in the sky, but now that I knew Dusk was involved, it made more sense that we were literally dodging lightning. What do we do? He shook his head, sending water droplets from his dark shoulder-length hair and thick beard in all directions. We need to get indoors. You'll never make it to your apartment. It was hard to get my bearings as the rain continued to thrash us. Something slammed into the wall beside us, missing us by inches. Green planks of wood splintered, and I recognized the distinctive mint green color. I'd seen it on a broken shutter just yesterday. We're near Argus's place, I said. Hikari shook as if the entire island was going to drop from the sky. Farage darted back onto the main street, and I followed as closely as I could. Lightning crackled through the streets as if Zeus were playing target practice. My legs were jelly, and my hair stood on end as I sprinted toward the door. Farage yelled for me, and when I peeked up through the rain, I could see him standing in Argus's doorway, reaching out to me. Run! he screamed, his hands shaking like he was prepared to snatch me into the shelter the second I came in range. Terrified I'd slip again, I moved as fast and as carefully as possible. A piercing white light flashed around me, the accompanying sound causing a high-pitched ringing in my ears. I lunged for the door and Farage's hands closed around my wrists. He slammed the door behind me and we turned to see a stunned Argus peek around the couch. What's happening? he asked. Looks like Dusk isn't happy about Thorn getting back on his feet. Perhaps absorbing our Valkrams isn't working out how we thought. It wasn't a comforting thought, but the tension eased from my body as the warm glow of Argus's apartment welcomed us. It was warm and dry and seemingly safe from the elements, or at least I hoped it was. We caught our breath and Argus brought us some towels to dry off, 
but Farage didn't take one. You're going back out there? Are you crazy? I asked. If Ciel is at the rupture, she might be in trouble. I have to help. I'm coming too, I said. He put his hand on my shoulder. Your flying skills aren't there yet. Besides, Argus needs you here. I turned to look at Argus, and sure enough, he was so on edge that he looked like a cat with its back arched, about to twitch in a hundred different directions. I turned back to Farage. Promise you'll be careful? He nodded. You promise too. I understood Farage's desire to help and felt it inside me as well. When I got another chance to practice flying, I was going to push myself to the limit. That way, the next time someone needed my help, I'd be ready. Chapter 11 Farage I knew that once I was in the air, I'd be okay, but taking off was tricky in this weather. With all the buildings around, I could easily be tossed into one if the wind shifted suddenly. I considered moving to the edge of Hakari and jumping out into the open, but similarly, I could be tossed back into the cliffs if I wasn't careful. Instead, I'd have to count on my clumsy human body to get to the bottom of the stairs and cross the bridge to the wheat fields. There, I'd have enough space to take off. I stepped back out into the rain and the wind immediately shifted as if it could sense me there. I moved quickly, keeping to the narrow alleyways where the wind was limited, but the overhanging roofs poured streams of water down on me from both sides. The stones were more than slippery as the water had begun to accumulate, turning staircases into torrented waterfalls. I struggled to keep my footing until the water pressure knocked me straight off my feet. It swept me through the streets and down several flights and I fought it until I realized I was being taken exactly where I wanted to go. I did my best to stop myself from scraping against the hard surfaces and my body was tossed about, but I was only halfway successful. Just as the golden gates of the city came into view, a loud crack overhead made me freeze in place. The lightning struck the gates, setting off jagged streaks of light and energy in every direction. Sweat slipped down the back of my neck as I waited for the gates to stop sparking. As soon as I saw a window, I charged feeling tiny specks of heat burning my shoulders as I passed through. The once sturdy bridge trembled under my feet as I tried to get my bearings. Forced by gusts of wind, I slammed into the bridge's banister, my ribs flaring in pain. Oh, I'm not going to make it. I began to shift. I shut out the elements, drawing my focus to a single point. This single moment. I used the forceful winds like steps, climbing on them to rise into the air. I glided through the currents, feeling the vibrations of the thunder, and diving to avoid the bolts that seemed to only miss me by inches. With my vision enhanced in hawk form, I noticed several ultraviolet trails moving toward Hakari, but the storm was too rough for me to see what was causing them. It was probably nothing, perhaps traces of some creature that had been tossed in that direction by the wind. I had to see if CL was holding up okay at the rupture. I had just lost Arena and wasn't willing to lose another friend so soon. Darkness enveloped every one of my senses as I dropped low to look for CL. The storm was more subdued by the rupture, as if we were in the eye of the storm. The sounds of battle rose and I banked right to follow the din. I quickly picked up the ultraviolet trails of CL and Jamin, and my worry eased. I was glad I wasn't the only Valkyrie who had decided to help out. I should have known. There was a significant increase in the number of Riven, and it must have been due to how much of the sunlight was blocked out by the storm. Farage! Jay yelled. What's going on? He slashed at a Riven. Is this dusk? The wind might have been technically softer here, but the howling was a tidal wave, drowning out almost everything in earshot. I swooped down and slashed through the Riven behind him and shot straight for Ciel. The dust of the Riven mixed with the rain made the air smell burnt as if someone had just thrown a bucket of water onto a campfire nearby. I peered through the darkness, my ultraviolet vision picking up on the Riven's trails as they surrounded her. Before I even got close, though, she dispatched them all at once. I banked back to join Jamin and shifted into human form as I landed beside him. What is this power? Jamin asked. I have a theory, I said, but I hoped it was wrong. Before I could explain, a new swarm of Riven found us. The Riven's attacks were too strong to explain, but I doubted the storm could last forever at this intensity. We only had to outlast it. I shifted quickly and launched myself back into attack mode, my thoughts reeling as I went. 
I'd seen lightning as an ability before, just never used in this way. That power had belonged to Irina, but she had only used it for entertainment after she'd lost her wings and confined herself to the palace. If Dusk had gotten his hands on her Valkram before she'd moved on, he could have taken control of her ability. It also explained why, in her last few hours, she'd given up hope so quickly. I shuddered to think she'd been going through that on top of everything else, and she might not have known it. If we made it through the storm, I'd need to ask Thorn how having his Vulcrum consumed by dusk had affected him. The three of us fought side by side until my wings grew sore, but with all of us working together, we were able to keep the darkness at bay. I didn't know how long we'd be there, but I knew we were prepared to battle it out as long as it was necessary. After a few brutal hours, the storm eased. The wind slowed. The torrential rain became a lazy drizzle and bits of the setting sun slipped orange beams through the gray cloud cover. It seemed, despite Dusk's best effort, that we'd made it through another trial unscathed, or so I thought. In my rush to join my fellow Valkyries, I'd glossed over an important detail, one that ended up costing the lives of the very people I'd sworn to protect. Chapter 12 Valerie. I set a bowl of macaroni and cheese down in front of Argus. It was a recipe that required minimal ingredients or skill, and it was also comfort food, offered when we were both desperate for comfort. Each time we settled in, the storm roared, reminding us that it was still a threat to us. But I was glad to have a storm partner. Argus plunged his spoon into the bowl and shoved as many noodles into his mouth as he could fit. I appreciated him being a big eater, and I was beginning to think that I was the only one around here beside Farage. I smiled at him, watching him munch away at his dinner, almost having forgotten the storm, lost in the cheesy goodness of his dinner. My plan was to butter him up to see if he could recount his first few minutes as a Valkyrie for me. I thought it might be a helpful distraction for both of us. Argus, I started. Can I ask you a question? He didn't even look up from his bowl. Sure. I wanted to know what it was like when you became a Valkyrie. Well, he said between bites, I saw Ajax there, and I was really scared. I didn't want him to die. I knew I could help, so I just ran in there without thinking. I listened with fascination. It was a tale I could relate to easily. In fact, I'd earned my place as a Valkyrie in a similar fashion when I had defended him from a riven not too long ago. He continued recounting his transformation and was just getting to the good part when we heard the first screams. We fell silent, and I listened carefully, hoping that it had only been the wind as it whipped through the streets. I straightened, and several seconds passed without another scream, giving me hope. False hope. An agonizing cry tore through the air outside, and Argus leaped to his feet. It's okay, Argus, I said as I pulled my dagger from the holder on my leg and stepped in front of him. The air filled with muffled cries. What if they need my help? I headed straight for the door, but just before I grabbed the knob... Argus grabbed my arm. Please don't go, he said with a sniff. I could feel his fingers trembling, so I knelt to his height and said, Okay, don't worry, I won't let anything happen to you. Can I take a peek outside to see what's going on? He nodded, so I waved him back behind me and then cracked the door open. A powerful gust of wind and rain nearly shoved the door into my face, and I'd need to go farther into the storm than I'd anticipated to get a decent look around. The streets were flooded, overtaken by a deluge of water. My attention moved to something dark in my periphery. A riven crept through the streets like a ghost, unaffected by the storm. I wanted to rush out and kill it before it reached someone, but I had just told Argus I'd stay. I scanned the streets for more, but there weren't any in sight. I poked my head back into the apartment. What is it? He asked, half in tears. I wanted to lie to him, but he was a Valkyrie now. If I explained things clearly, 
You would understand. Argus, there's a riven outside. Can I go stop him? He nodded, but I could see the fear and reluctance in his wide and watery eyes. I hurried over to the couch, grabbed a blanket that was draped there. I wrapped it around him and sat him in front of his mac and cheese. I'll be back before you even finish your food. Lock the door and don't answer it unless you hear me knock like this. I knocked on the table, two close together, a pause, and then another two. I rushed out, terrified that I'd lose sight of the riven. It was a few paces farther, but still in view of Argus's apartment. Screams arose, but the sound echoed through the air, and I couldn't determine which direction it was coming from. I stepped carefully through the water, my foot threatening to give out with every push of the ankle-deep torrent. The riven was facing away from me, so it didn't see me coming as I leaped off the stairs and plunged my dagger into the shadowy monster. It let out a screech, thrashing its sword-like limbs until it dissolved to dust and was swept away with the current. I had no time to bask in the accomplishment of killing it. A few paces away, I spotted another one. I looked back, feeling a little too far away from Argus's apartment. If I got any farther, I might not be able to get to him in time if something went wrong. But I couldn't let it roam around Hikari and risk it sending innocent dwellers to Nether. I decided to go after it. My previous kill had been such a success. Why not do it that way again? There was a bend in the road with apartments all around. It had nowhere to go. I geared up for my jump, giving myself a little, you got this, pep talk, before I leaped off the stairs once again. Before I connected, the riven vanished as if it were made of smoke. I landed hard, my feet slipping as the current slammed me into the apartment wall. Dumbfounded, I stood in the rain as lightning crackled overhead. Then I heard screams coming from inside the apartment. My heart slammed into my chest, and I waded through the knee-deep water to the apartment's front door. I tried to open it, but it was locked. I knocked, then yanked, and finally pried the door open just in time to see the riven cut into a middle-aged woman. Her mouth was agape, her eyes wide with a silent scream still on her lips. I charged in, slicing through the riven with my dagger, just in time to see the woman turn to dust before my eyes. I fell to my knees, stunned by how quickly she had gone. The weight of losing her nearly crushed me. I slammed my fists on the ground in frustration, and then a new fear assaulted me. Argus. I ran through to the door and back into the waterlogged street, this time going against the current. I fought the forceful push of the water. My ears turned to one sound I prayed I wouldn't hear. I battled the current, Traversing back to Argus's home, when I saw it. A streak of ashen gray, folding itself into the wall, slipping through the barrier and into the building. I panted, sheathing my dagger and using my arms to propel me forward as I raced back to his apartment. Don't be dead, don't be dead, please. I knocked wildly on the door. Ah, the secret knock. This time I knocked the way I'd shown him. Still no response. I only lasted a second before my anxiety compelled me to break the door open. Argus! I called as I dashed inside, pulling my dagger from my thigh, and saw Argus slip out of the grasp of a riven. I leaped, plunging my dagger into its back, and it shrieked, dissipating into ash and smoke. I whirled around, looking frantically for Argus, and saw him trembling in the corner of his kitchen his eyes flickering between each wall, no doubt waiting for more of the sickening beasts to intrude his sanctuary all over again. It's okay, Argus, I said as I walked over and knelt down in front of him. I held out my hand and he took it, pulling himself to his feet. Are you still hungry? I offered. He nodded and we walked to the cupboards. Argus glued to my side like a shadow. Together we cooked more comfort foods and I tried to calm him with chatter about his favorites and purgatory-exclusive foods. There were other people in Hikari that needed me, and Argus was too small to go out into the storm, so I had a choice to make. Abandon the rest of Hikari to save Argus, or risk losing him to Nether. 
I knew what choice CL would make, and Irina, Jamin, Farage, and Thorne. But they weren't me. Whether that meant I wasn't Valkyrie material or not, I didn't know. I looked into Argus's big brown eyes, and I knew I couldn't forsake him to save the others. Stay beside me, Argus, I said. I promise to keep you safe. Chapter 13 Farage Seventy-three souls. That's how many we lost to Nether in a single day. We spent the night the next morning trying to figure out just how badly we'd failed the dwellers of Hokari. We entered every home to make sure that all the Riven had been destroyed, but that wasn't going to bring anyone back from the dead. Thorn limped around the palace, his hands locked together behind his head as he mumbled to himself. It was, by far, the biggest loss we'd suffered since the eclipse. And I could tell by the defeated look on everyone's faces that we all felt responsible. How could we let this happen? Thorn asked. Lily followed him like a shadow, trying to guide him toward a chair. This is your fault, CL spat. Her rage directed at Ajax, who leaned casually against a column. He put his hands up. Hey, don't look over here. I might not have helped fight off the Riven, but I didn't have anything to do with them getting in here. And we're supposed to believe you? Jamin shook his head. We're letting you stay in Lux. The least you could do is your job. Ajax grinned. Everyone's looking for someone to blame. He sighed. But you all forget that I can hear what you're thinking. You're not mad at me. You're mad at yourselves. Jamin and Ciel feel responsible for letting the Riven through the rupture. He turned to Valerie. Shall I go on? Valerie shook her head, but Ajax ignored it. Valerie chose to let people die in order to keep Argus safe. I knew I was next, but when his green eyes landed on me, fear seeped into my bones. And perhaps the guiltiest among us is Farage. The other Valkyrie stared at me, hanging on Ajax every word. He was right about me being guilty, and more so than the others. He was the executioner, and the gavel was about to drop. Farage saw the enemy approaching Hakari and ignored it. Silence fell around the room, but Ajax wasn't finished. His gaze moved back to Ciel. So don't come for me. He curtsied playfully and then headed for the door, leaving the rest of us to sort through the rubble of the bomb he'd just dropped. The Valkyrie stared at me, and I searched for the words to explain. But they didn't come. Is that true, Farage? Thorne asked. I swallowed a lump in my throat. I I thought I was mistaken. The wind was strong and, and the trails could have come from anywhere. The more I spoke, the hollower my excuses sounded. I should have investigated them closer. And now innocent people had paid the ultimate price for having faith in me. When I had failed them. I need to get back to the rupture. Jamin brushed past me. I'm coming too, CL said, following him out. I felt as though I were catapulted back to the night of the eclipse when I'd failed just as spectacularly. A year ago, I had been increasingly irritated by the other Valkyries. I was frustrated with Ajax and CL's constant questioning of my beliefs, always pushing me to date when I hadn't wanted to. I was angry that Jamin and Valerie had disappeared for days at a time, leaving the rest of us to pick up the slack, and I was annoyed that Tayo had trusted Arena and Thorn with the most responsibility. I'd reached a breaking point and gone to the Crimson Orchard to spend time as a hawk, determined not to let myself be tempted to shift back into the angry man I was. I hadn't even known there was going to be an eclipse, but when I saw it, I thought it was a sign that I'd made the right choice. My hawk's ultraviolet vision had been exceptionally powerful, so I'd eaten my fill of rodents before settling into meditation. I'd woken without realizing I'd fallen asleep, feeling refreshed and calm. I had planned to apologize and take the time to meditate more often, so I wouldn't lose myself in that dark place again. 
I'd flown to Hokari to meet up with the others and make peace when I'd seen the riven tearing through our city. Maybe it was because the memory often resurfaced in my dreams, but I'd never forget the look in Thorne's eyes as he yelled, Where were you? It was the same look I saw in them now. I had promised never to allow anger to control me again, and had taken regular trips to the orchard to meditate ever since. As Thorne and Lily left the room, I felt the anger bubble up in the pit of my stomach. Anger at myself for making a mistake, and at the other Valkyries for putting the blame entirely on me. Valerie approached me, and I prepared myself for whatever shot she was about to take. I'm so sorry for Hush, she said. You saved me. It's a very nice sentiment, Valerie. One that you should have shared while the others were here. She didn't deserve my venom. I sighed. Why are we all afraid of each other? She wrapped her arms around me. We lost the day. We're all hurting. We all feel responsible. I rubbed her arm. It was the most I could give. She backed away, her eyes widening. What if there was a way to close the rupture? What? None of us have that kind of power. Have we ever tried to harness it? I scratched my beard trying to remember the last time, but I couldn't. Of course, she said politely as she patted my shoulder and then left me alone, her small spark of hope quickly fizzling out. And why should she have hope? There was no way to close the rupture and certainly no time to figure out how to do so before the eclipse. I wandered around the palace for a little while longer after everyone left. For some reason, I couldn't seem to get Valerie's idea out of my head. Perhaps the spark had not gone out. Perhaps she'd lit a fire within me. Chapter 14 Valerie Ever since the storm, I couldn't stand the thought of going back to my apartment for any significant length of time. I popped in, grabbing things I thought I'd need, a change of clothes, a good-looking book, and some toiletries, and then headed off to camp out in Argus's apartment. An added bonus of that plan was that Ajax wouldn't know where to find me. He was indifferent to the fact that we'd lost so many people. He said I would be too if I knew the truth. It just seemed too callous, and once again I found myself questioning what kind of person I was. But how could I judge Ajax when I'd stepped aside and let those people be dragged to Nether just to protect Argus? I'd checked the streets the next morning and was sad to see the mint green shutter had been lost to the storm. The squeaky, unoiled hinges no longer a marker of Argus's home. But it wasn't the only thing lost. From the moment the first Riven had slipped through the wall and into Argus's apartment, he seemed unsettled. I'd anticipated it as a possibility and fought my way through the water to get to him. I'd easily fought off the two intruders that came several hours apart, but they still seemed to take away Argus's sense of safety. His home was overrun with Riven. His walls did not keep him safe. I didn't wait for him to ask me to come back to his place. I just went there. After breakfast, Argus fell asleep straight away, and I wasn't surprised. We'd made it through a long, anxious night together, waiting for the Riven to burst through the walls and try to harm us. I, however, was too wired, too overwhelmed. I decided to sneak out during Argus's nap to see if I could get some flying practice in. I wasn't sure Faraj would still want to train me after I hadn't jumped in to defend him for his actions the day before, but the Valkyries had wings for a reason. If I wanted to defend the realm, discover the truth, and find a way to close the rupture for good, I'd need more mobility. I slipped out and placed the door back on its hinges, closing it gently behind me. I paused and put my ear to the door, listening for movement. All was still, so I headed down the damp stairs and towards the gates to Hakari. I jogged over the bridge and onto the field. When I was a safe distance away from the cliffs, I opened my wings, but the wind resistance yanked me back, and I landed on my butt, 
hard. How the hell do they all make this look so easy? I retracted my wings and stood back up, dusting myself off and adjusting my position to put the wind behind me before I attempt to open them again. This time, the wind pushed at my back. I stumbled forward a bit, but it was more manageable than the other way. I tried to remember what the Valkyries looked like when they took off to see if I could mimic their form, but I hadn't really been paying close attention. Here goes nothing. I flapped my wings as hard as I could, making it only as high as I could jump before slamming back down. No problem, I'll just try it again. After several more failed attempts, I decided to get a running start. I hadn't seen any of the Valkyries fly this way, or any birds for that matter. I groaned. I'm an idiot, trying to take off like a freaking airplane. Still, it seemed like the most promising way to get in the air. I made sure to have the wind at my back, then ran as fast as I could, flapping my wings and trying to block out any thoughts about how much of an asshole I must have looked like. I leaped, and the wind seemed to pin my wings down, resulting in a near face plant. I sat on the ground, wheat blades tangled in my hair, and one dangerously close to going up my nose. What the heck was that? Jamin asked. I spun and saw Jamin standing there, staring, his head cocked to the side. You know planes fly into the wind, right? I shifted. Uh, I do now. I said, getting to my feet. He reached to help me up, but I swatted his hands away. How do I just fly upward? He grinned. But you were on the cusp of greatness with that airplane method. I put my hands on my hips, forcing myself not to ogle him. Jay! Frustration seeped into my voice. The playfulness faded from his eyes, and his eyes darkened flitting to the ground as if he'd just remembered all the reasons why we couldn't be together. They were just as critical as ever, maybe even more so now that we'd lost so many souls to Nether. I clenched my jaw, holding my breath as if it would somehow pass the time faster, but it didn't. After a few silent moments, he looked back up at me, his expression so indifferent that I was tempted to kiss him just to break through it. I didn't, though. I was just as disappointed in him as he was in me. You know what? Farage is best at teaching this kind of thing. I'll send him your way. He forced a polite smile. The kind you give a distant relative that you don't remember but are forced to endure at family events. I was hurting, but I knew I wasn't alone in that. I only had a few precious memories to anguish over, and he had many lifetimes worth. I was too distracted to analyze his form as he took off. I knew it would be a little while before Farage made it here, if he came at all. Left to my own thoughts, I had to wonder if maybe Jamin and I were never meant to be together at all. Chapter 15 Farage I was perched on the palace banister, about to fly to the orchard for my daily meditation, when I saw Jamin approaching, I could see in his flight pattern that his wings were tense and I braced myself for more bad news. He landed smoothly on the balcony. Hey, Farage, Valerie's ready for her flying lesson. I nodded. I wanted to delay shifting as long as possible. He threaded his fingers, resting them on his head, and let out a sigh. Why is this so hard? I tilted my head to indicate I wasn't sure what he was referring to but I was pretty sure that this was about Valerie. She leaves here, heads right into the darkness, and she doesn't even remember why, but I'm supposed to just trust that it was for a good reason? I was glad Hawkform prevented me from answering with words. It was a complex situation that I was better off staying out of. I understood his reluctance to trust her as she had gone against everything we stood for as Valkyries. She'd made a horrible mistake that had let the rest of us through a lot of heartache and pain, and yet instead of regret, she appeared more inclined to repeat history in the hopes of figuring out why she'd done it the first time. Jamin was a sensitive man. I wasn't sure he'd survive another heartbreak. Is, is it Ajax getting into her head? Or is this just jealousy talking? On the other hand, if they 
were truly partners, they had to trust each other. Jamin's suspicions were driving a wedge between them. I wasn't sure I wanted Jamin following Valerie to the dark side, but watching Valerie sort out where her loyalties lay, I'd started to question whether there really was more to purgatory than we'd originally thought. King Tayo had been here long before the rest of us, so we'd always just taken his word on everything. It seemed so obvious. Not one, but two of our Valkyries believed, on some level, that there was more to Nether than we'd been told, and that was worth looking into, but it didn't seem worth the lives we'd lost as a result. Jamin's head dropped. How can she rely on me if I don't have her back? He rubbed his face with his hands. I'm losing her again, and it's my own damn fault, just like it was last time. I stared. I'd never heard him blame himself for Valerie's disappearance before, but it certainly would explain why he'd been so angry all this time. He looked up at me like he suddenly remembered I was there. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to drop all that on you. He backed away. Anyway, good luck with your lesson. I nodded to the weed fields, hoping he'd understand my meaning. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll catch up with her later. I was proud of him for working through his issues. If all of the Valkyries could do that, we might have a chance of surviving the next eclipse. I let out a loud screech to say goodbye and then headed to the fields to meet Valerie. When I arrived, she looked as lost and sad as Jamin had a few minutes ago. I was going to make this lesson more difficult. I shifted and landed beside her in human form. Farage, you made it! I wasn't exactly sure you'd come after. Don't worry about it. Let's get started. I stepped to the side, gesturing toward the open field. Show me what you got. She grimaced, but started running, flapping her wings and trying to lift off the ground. The wind resistance on her flailing wings kept knocking her off balance. I silently enjoyed the show stifling my laughter until she finally collapsed on the ground, exhausted. I nodded with approval as I approached her, leaning over her as she caught her breath. That was very entertaining. She rolled her eyes and got to her feet. That wasn't my best one. I got a little air the time before. I snorted. Why can't I go straight up? She asked. The others do it. I just feel like aerodynamically, it's, it's not possible. Firstly, you're clearly not an expert in aerodynamics. She pursed her lips. And second, people aren't supposed to have wings. This doesn't work scientifically. It's supernatural. So your whole run and jump method is not going to get you there. Oh, she said, nodding with a pleased smile. Magic works. She lifted her wings and checked her body. So is there some kind of up button somewhere? I have to warn you. This isn't going to be that easy. It's about letting go of your emotional baggage and being in the moment. She put her hands on her hips and shrugged. So I'm screwed then. It's not that hard. Let me show you a technique. I learned to help me with my anger. Anger? You? Yeah, right. I chuckled. Then you can see that this method works. Now, close your eyes and turn your face toward the sun. She obeyed. Take a deep breath. Don't stop inhaling until your lungs are completely full. Then, let it out slowly until they're totally empty. She began to breathe. I felt a sense of peace as I walked her through my process. I hadn't realized how infectious it was. Focus on your breathing and the feeling of that light on your face. The light is healing washing away every bad thing that has ever happened. Feel the light as it heals you, both physically and emotionally. Focus on nothing else. After several minutes, I spoke again. Now, we're going to shift your focus to one emotion. Let it fill your body and your thoughts. Let it roam. Let it breathe. Focus all of your energy on this one emotion. The word is gratitude. Before I'd even finished the word, Valerie shot into the air like a bullet. 
After a few hundred feet, her bat-like wings spread, and she slowly turned as she floated back down like a maple seed. In her, I saw the missing piece. I wondered how long I'd been taking things for granted. I wasn't perfect, but I was still here, still trying to do the right thing even after I'd fallen short. I watched Valerie descend, all the while thinking I was giving her the ability to fly, when perhaps I was teaching myself as well. I was ready to move forward. From losing Arena, from blaming myself, from feeling unworthy to exist as a man. Whatever dark days were on the horizon, we'd face them together. Chapter 16 Valerie I practiced with Farage all afternoon until he left for his shift at the rupture. I'd gotten to the point where I could consistently get myself into the air, but it took nearly a whole minute of Farage's meditation each time. While flying rushed back to me as if I still had hundreds of years of muscle memory, my landings were always rough. My body was starting to look a little worse for the wear from the falls I'd been taking, so I decided to call it a day. I wasn't comfortable asking Argus to heal me. Not yet. I considered returning to his apartment, but after the night we'd had, I didn't want to disturb his slumber. The sun was starting to bend toward the horizon, the pale yellow deepening to orange as it lowered. There was somewhere that I wanted to be when the colors overtook the sky. The salt flat. It was a short flight away, an appropriate challenge for someone at my level, not to mention the water might cushion my landing a bit if I was lucky. I closed my eyes, breathing deeply and focusing my mind on the light. After several deep breaths, I began to list things I was grateful for. I was grateful for the promise of my friends and family from life, as well as my memories being returned to me when I eventually moved on. I was grateful for the connections I'd made since I arrived in purgatory. Argus, Irina, Ciel, Thorn, Lily, Farage, even Ajax. I was grateful for the ability to fly and open portals, for the chance to discover my favorite thing all over again. The damn party cream puffs, and every single second I spent with Jamin. I didn't need to open my eyes to know I was in the air. The rush of the wind on my face and shoulders said it all. There was something powerful in that kind of thinking, something more than the ability to fly. It helped me to remember what I had and why I should keep fighting away the darkness. It illuminated the connections between everyone, living or dead, interwoven like iridescent threads in a master tapestry. I flexed my wings, opening my eyes and soaking in the beauty of the wheat fields as they swayed in the pale orange sunset. I sailed toward the salt flat, nearly gasping at its beauty as I swept over it, I gazed down at my reflection, my outstretched bat wings, my pink-tipped hair, my brown skin, the sun set behind me like I was on fire. I was powerful, a force, relentless in my convictions and fierce in spirit. There was a lot to be grateful for, just not my landing. I dipped a little too low. My knee skimmed the water, knocking me out of the air and forcing my body to skip across the shallows like a flat stone on a summer camp lake. I laughed until I cried, my stomach aching, my clothes and hair completely drenched. I retracted my wings and pulled myself to my feet, checking myself for damage. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the silhouette of someone approaching on foot, just as the bottom of the sun touched the horizon. The silhouette was blurred with the powerful red of the sun's last stand, but as he moved closer, I recognized Jamin. I swallowed a lump in my throat, suddenly irritatingly conscious that I had hands and didn't know what to do with them. I tried wringing out my shirt, but I was soaked through. Of course, I look like a wet dog, and he looks like... Well, I waited until he finally came clearly into view. Of course, he looks like a mouth-watering plate of pancakes on Sunday morning. His eyes were intense, but his mouth had a small smile that said he came in peace. His hands were in his pockets, his hair smoothed back with what was probably literally hair product of the gods, and his skin glowed in the light of the setting sun. 
He looked me up and down and sighed. Did you feel like a swim? I had a little trouble with my landing. He rubbed his hands over his face, and I only got a small peek at the smile he was concealing. Then it faded. Crap, here comes the bad news. Valerie, he said, shaking his head. I could tell from the sound of my name that he was saying goodbye. I wanted to interrupt him, to scream, don't do this, we'll find a way to make it work. But I was paralyzed by fear. I need to tell you what happened the night of the eclipse. My heartbeat raced, my knees going weak as his dark gaze bore into me. He stepped closer. You've always had this unique connection to Nether because of your gift. We'd all known it for a long time, but a few months before the eclipse, you started to question if that connection meant something. You grew increasingly tempted to open a portal and have a look around. You talked to me about it often, and I always managed to convince you that it would be too dangerous to go there, that you'd be risking our eternity together if you went. I could tell you weren't happy, so I tried to distract you with extravagant dates and delicious foods. But no matter what I did, you kept coming back to those same thoughts. One night, we got in a huge fight over it. You said things, I said things, you left and stayed out half the night. I was worried sick. I searched everywhere and eventually found you at the salt flat and convinced you to come home. I felt myself shake. Though I'd never heard the story from his point of view, I had a good idea of where it was going. When I had first arrived in Lux, I may not have believed myself capable of betraying the other Valkyries. But now I knew for sure. I couldn't. There was more to this story, more to Nether. The answer was right in front of my face, and yet, completely out of reach. You never really did come home, though. Nor did you bring Nether up to me again. You started spending your free time with Ajax, and I was jealous. But you needed someone to listen, and he was eager to. I felt myself losing you. I watched what we had slowly die. I confronted you and made all the wrong assumptions about you and Ajax. Instead of getting angry, you took my hand and begged me to come with you to the salt flat. You begged me to let you explain what you thought you knew. We were so consumed in our fight that we didn't notice the red tinge as the sun eclipsed, not until the first scream broke through. We tried to fight off the Riven, but there were too many. Lives were lost all around us. We got separated, and I fought my hardest to get back to you. You were fierce, but getting further away. Ajax landed beside you, and suddenly, all the fight I had in me drained from my body at once. You turned to him, and I couldn't hear what you said, but I could see the intensity in your expression. He nodded, and you opened a portal. I screamed your name, and you turned and looked me dead in the eye. You hesitated even after Ajax stepped through, but then, just like that, you were gone. I could feel the pain dripping off of every word. I wanted to pull him in and kiss him, to tell him I was sorry, but how could I? How could I when I was still drowning in my quest for the truth? I told the other Valkyries that Ajax pulled you through. I used anger to try and cope with the fact that I'd never see you again. He stepped closer, putting his forehead to mine. And it was entirely my fault. Stunned, my thoughts raced back through his story to try and see his fault in it. I felt a warm, wet drop as a tear slid down my cheek. I'm so sorry, Valerie, he said, his voice cracking with raw emotion. I should have listened. I should have gone with you. I've tried to be mad at you all this time, but I've been mad at myself for not trusting you. He cradled my face in his hands, burning me with his tearful gaze. I promise if you give me another chance, I won't screw this up again. I'll follow you to Nether. I'll help you figure out whatever it is you're searching for, I swear, Valerie. I'll burn Lux to the ground if you say so. I smiled through my own tears. Jamin wiped them away with his thumbs, his demeanor softening. And you'll never 
need to face your demons alone. The sky mixed with pink and purple as the sun dropped beyond the horizon, and I took a moment to compose myself. I was so full of flutters and warmth, and they both kept a steady stream of tears flowing down my face. I wiped them, laughing at myself for getting so swept up. I sniffled. Kiss me, you idiot. Jamin's arms wrapped around me, and his lips landed hot on mine, filling my body with electricity. My head clouded and I pulled him in tighter. I strained for breath but didn't dare let go, pulling him closer. In my joyous delirium, I flexed a muscle in my shoulder I hadn't intended to, and my wings shot out, knocking us slightly off balance. Jamin laughed against my lips, then pulled away, sliding his hands up my body to retract my wings. He stopped, his eyes widening as his mouth dropped open. In my peripheral, I caught a glimpse of something fluffy reflected on the water beside me. I turned and realized that two feathery white wings jutted from my back. My wings! They're back to normal! I skipped around the salt flat, joyously checking my reflection in the water as I rubbed my hands over the soft feathers. Jamin came up behind me, wrapping his arms around me and smiling down at my reflection over my shoulder. We rocked slowly side to side, looking down at the visage of our loved-up reflections as the last of the pink hues streaked through the sky. I closed my eyes, feeling the warmth of Jamin's cheek against mine. We were invincible. I'm so happy, I whispered. Me too, he said, kissing my cheek. You look like an angel. A desperately unsettling feeling tore through me, and my eyes snapped open, that cursed word still hanging in the air. I stared down. My joy shattered. A horrible scream burst from my chest, and Jamin's voice became a distant blur. This time, when I looked at my reflection, all I saw was the horrific truth staring back at me. Keep listening for Episode 6. Jamin. This has been Eleven Wings, Book 5, Farage, written by Brittany Chanel and performed by Kevin Montoya and Brittany Goodwin. Stay tuned for the next book. Fly until you reach the silver lining Keep your gaze on the sky Reach out a hand to the silver lining And remember the reason we fly Fly until you reach the silver lining Keep your gaze on the sky Reach out a hand to the silver lining Remember the reason we fly